So this is our fourth class. Our final push is this week and then next week in the final class five on the Blessed Virgin Mary. So you're to be congratulated. Uh, you've, you've pushed through so far the first three classes. We had a little break so that you could rest your minds a bit and uh, get ready for uh, our next topic. You might recall that uh, the name of this series is uh, The Theology of Grace. And we spent the first three classes really talking about the terms of that theology, the nature-grace uh, distinction in Catholic theology. We spent some time on Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation and the Council of Trent's response to that, that further developed the theology of grace. And then in the third class, we spent time on the spiritual life and discernment of grace in our lives. So we haven't given nature enough attention. And so tonight's class, we're going to pivot a little bit and spend some time on uh, nature and probably the dominant view uh, advanced by Charles Darwin on the theory of evolution that is taught broadly and widely in schools and really it's in our culture and affects a lot of different subjects not only in science but in other disciplines and ways we think about things. So we're balancing things out a little bit tonight by talking about nature and some of the implications, as I mentioned here, for Genesis and the human person, which is, of course, very relevant to any theology of grace and the person. Now, I should point out that this is a very technical subject, the first part, which is on Darwin's theory of evolution. The only things I will talk about are what you would find in a freshman in high school textbook on biology. So don't worry. I'm not a microbiologist, and you didn't come here this evening to hear <laughs> a lecture on microbiology. So I will keep it very down the middle, uh, where there's consensus among the scientific community and what's not in dispute. As we know, what usually happens is the interpretation is what's at dispute, not the facts themselves, as you will see. So what we're going to talk about specifically today is... Darwin's theory of evolution. And often it's not properly distinguished between microevolution, which happens within a species, like a bird getting a larger beak or a smaller beak, and macroevolution, which refers to the origin of species in general, as well as that transition from uh, chemical evolution to life, origin of life studies. So how do we get life from inorganic material. After we go through that, and I will be concise, I'll present the three, what I think are the most compelling counterarguments against the dominant orthodoxy today in Darwinism as it's taught in high school and college. And uh, there, there could be 33, but I'll mention the three that are probably the most mentioned in the literature and, in my opinion, the most decisive. And then We'll talk about the Catholic position on evolution and the implications for Genesis, in particular the first three chapters of Genesis through the fall, and uh, what that means for the human person. So that's, that's our program tonight, focusing on nature and its implications then for theology. So if you go to the next page, Charles Darwin, uh, who lived in the 19th century, wrote a book on the origin of species. Interestingly, in the first six editions of this book, the word evolution is never mentioned. Uh, it was finally made its way in in the seventh edition in uh, 1872, as just an aside. And what Darwin noted, what motivated him to write the work in the first place, is he noticed how farmers could domesticate different cattle that they would raise for beneficial traits. So, for example, the sheep herders in northern Scotland when the winters got colder and colder in the 19th century, he noticed how they started breeding sheep with thicker wool. And the idea entered his mind from other influences as well that nature can mimic the domestication of animals that human beings do. And that was the, the, the guiding observation for Charles Darwin in writing the book on the origin of species. Some of this might be familiar to you as, as we go through. But as I write here in bold, the general theory basically uh, affirms that life 
evolved from a common ancestor or a common set of ancestors, which Darwin uh, writes about in The Origin, by natural selection working on random mutations of physical traits of different animals. So natural selection uh, working on the random mutations of, of physical characteristics of animals. So living things of the past in response to their environment would adapt. Uh, the, the famous example of the Galacobus uh, finches of the islands in South America Darwin noted they had different sized beaks depending on the size of the seeds that they were eating. So if they were eating large, hard seeds, they had larger, thicker beaks. If there were just small seeds around, they had smaller beaks. And, he, and though that example isn't in The Origin of Species, he noted that in his diary and in his writings. And so this mechanism of responding and adapting to your environment, driving favorable traits that allow you to survive as a species and carry forward the next generation. So finches that have large beaks breed and create baby finches that also have large beaks, and then they survive. Foxes that have fur that is white in wintertime aren't predators. Uh, they aren't subject to predators. They survive, and the foxes with brown hair in cold climates die off. They are adapting to their environment to survive, and they pass that on to their offspring. So this mechanism of natural selection working on these random mutations of physical characteristics of animals or any organism uh, are adaptive and creative and give the appearance of design of maybe God's handiwork, but in fact, it's purely driven by natural selection working on random mutations. So the key characteristics of the theory are natural selection is unguided. It's blind. It's merely selecting based upon who adapts best and survives a given environment. And it's gradual. Incremental changes drive uh, the adaptations that we see. And so Darwin, in looking at the spectrum of different organisms, and animals that he saw on his voyage uh, to South America began noting these characteristics. So the key characteristics of his theory are evolution is unguided, it's blind, and it's gradual. Incremental changes add up and accumulate. So microevolution, as I started to say, is this natural selection of advantageous traits, thick fur on sheep, thicker beaks on finches uh, within a species. That's microevolution. And that's really not uh, something that's in dispute, frankly. As I've mentioned in the past, every horse breeder and dog breeder uses microevolution all the time. Those farmers in northern Scotland intuitively knew by breeding sheep with thick fur with each other, they would get baby sheep, lambs, with thick Fur. So microevolution isn't really debatable, and it's obvious in our experience. <coughs> Macroevolution is where the controversy lies, in particular. And I'm speaking of a scientific controversy. I'm not even talking about religion. I'm talking within the scientific community what is meant and is macroevolution, as described by Darwin and the neo-Darwinists of today, is it even an adequate mechanism to explain what it purports to explain, namely the origin of life and the origin of species. So can a cow become a blue whale given enough time? That is a poster child for the, the neo-Darwinists to attempt to prove macro evolution. Or the fossils of horses uh, as another example used by Darwinists to show, they think, the truth of macroevolution. That incremental adaptive changes can lead to whole new species, or the origin of species, from inorganic matter. Sometimes called chem chemical evolution, as I mentioned here at the bottom. You might have heard the expression, the prebiotic soup. So if the Earth is about four and a half, five billion years old, let's say, and the first billion years was just inorganic matter, and uh, different things that somehow out of that life 
emerged. That is a mainline macroevolution uh, proposition. And it's, uh, we will spend some time talking about that. That's really going to be our focus tonight, is this macroevolution piece that I'm, that I'm talking about. But to put a little more shape to this, I'd like to read a quote from Stephen Jay Gold, who is a, a neo-Darwinist of a very interesting kind. Uh, but certainly within the neo-Darwinistic uh, school. So, quote, natural selection acts exclusively by the preservation and accumulation of variations which are beneficial under the organic and inorganic conditions to which each creature is exposed at all periods of life. The ultimate result is that each creature tends to become more and more improved in relation to its conditions. And now that's a quote from uh, Charles Darwin, Chapter 4 on the Origin of Species. Now, moving to Stephen Jay Gould, who wrote this book, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, the book is in intending to get at what is essential to the Darwinistic theory. And then he also made a recommendation on how to improve it. But in his view, and quoting from him, and as I mentioned before, evolution, the heart of it from Darwin is it's incremental and unguided because it's random. Quote, if the variations that yielded evolutionary change were large, producing new features or even new taxa in a single step, then natural selection as a theory of evolutionary change would perish. Variation itself would emerge as the primary and truly creative force. For this reason, saltationists, which means jumps, gaps, or macromutational, theories have always been viewed as anti-Darwin, anti-Darwinian. And so what he's getting at is if there are changes that explain the origin of species and species in general that require huge jumps or seismic events like a meteor striking the earth and it has carbon on it and then that created life, that's not a Darwinian theory. Because as we've been saying, Darwinian theory requires unguided, blind, and incremental change. So that's the first point he's making. The next point that Stephen Jay Gould makes is, quote, we come now to the heart of what natural selection requires. In going from A to a substantially different B, evolution must pass through a long and insensible sequence of intermediary steps. Ancestor and descendant must be linked by a series of changes each within range of what natural selection might construct from ordinary variability. Without gradualism in this form, large variations of discontinuous morphological import, rather than natural selection, might provide the creative force of evolutionary change. I will anticipate myself a little bit. What Stephen Jay Gould, who passed away, oh, maybe 15 years ago, who was a... Uh, a, uh, a microbiologist, not by training, but uh, w had a PhD, I believe, in zoology. Uh, what he is dealing with is the fact that the fossil record does not show incremental change, as we'll show in a moment. So the fossil record is not Darwinian. And so as a result, there has to be some other events that allow the natural selection framework to be held but with other variables that, in effect, uh, electrify it, put life into it. Uh, and so uh, we will touch on that a bit, but that's what Stephen J. Gold is up to, is how do I retain the framework of Darwin, unguided and incremental change, but account for the fact that the fossil record and other things we know are not Darwinian? And we'll get to that in a moment. So. What are the three challenges I mentioned earlier that I, I was going to talk about this evening? And they're all related to uh, this transition from chemical evolution to life, from the prebiotic soup to organisms on Earth. And the three are, one is very tactical, of, of the miller Uri experiment of 1953. You might be thinking, Charles, why on Earth are you spending time on that? You'll see in a moment. Second, the fossil record, as I just mentioned. Any honest assessment of it, and this is true even of Darwinists now, 
they recognize the fossil record does not give evidence of Darwinian evolution. Isn't this, uh, it, this sounds amazing to you, but uh, we'll go through the main headline in a moment, but this is the case. And then lastly, the discovery and development of DNA, which was something, uh, of course, 19th century biologists and zoologists like Darwin had no idea about. In fact, they had no theory of heredity, and they had no idea of the cell. They thought the cell was just a homogeneous glob of, of protoplasm, and very simple in its construction. So you could see why they focused on physical traits of organisms being passed on. They had no idea how heredity actually works, which is what DNA is. And so that will be decisive on why Darwinian evolution uh, can't account for the facts of science, particularly of the discovery of DNA. So as I say, I will keep this at the level of high school biology because that's all I ever took. <laughs> all right. Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, University of Chicago, 1953. Stanley Miller was his doctoral student, and they conducted an experiment. Now, the reason why I mention this experiment uh, is it's a very famous experiment and kind of launched the whole idea that we can get life from inorganic material of whatever the early Earth material was. And so they conducted an experiment by running an electric charge in a vacuum changer of hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor. And what they discovered two or three days later, after running the electrical charge through lightning, is a few amino acids formed uh, two or three days later in the vacuum chamber. So as a result, and as we know rushing forward, amino acids are actually the building blocks of proteins which carry out cellular activities. So, aha, we have a thread here of how we go from inorganic matter to living things. Darwin was right. It was just a matter of discovering it. The, the problem with this is that by the 1960s and 70s, geophysicists and geologists, and in my day we called it earth science, uh, at the University of Chicago and other places, concluded that the early Earth atmosphere was nothing like that experiment. In fact, the early atmosphere was more like carbon and nitrogen. And as they examined more of the Earth's mantle, the layers of the Earth where this uh, was isolated, by the early to mid-1960s, this experiment of, of Stanley Miller and Harold Urey was not taken seriously by anyone who was studying this. But as I mentioned here in this next uh, footnote, and it's in your bibliography, in biology textbooks to this day, taught in high school and college, the, this Miller-Urey experiment is presented uncritically as an example of macroevolution going from inorganic matter to living things, to this day. I even went to Half Price Off Books uh, nearby, and. What's nice about that bookshop is they have all the high school and college texts in math and science, and I always peruse them, just see what are they studying in this area. And every single freshman biology textbook refers to the Miller-Urey experiment as interesting, provocative, sometimes with some conditions, but as an example of Darwin's macro theory of evolution. And the truth is it has never been taken seriously for the last 50 years. So there's a gap between this interest that neo-Darwinists have in our education and what actual researchers are working on and thinking about. So I, I mentioned that as well. And if you don't believe me, please go to the article in Scientific America in February of 1991 where Stanley Miller is quoted, the problem of the origin of life has turned out to be much more difficult than I and most people and other people imagined. Because he recognized the research that had gone on for the last 30 years really disproved what they attempted to do in 1953. So that's, that's domino number one. Number two is the fossil record itself. And, and, and the, the most significant counter-argument to 
Darwin's macro theory of evolution, particularly as it relates to what's called speciation, which means how species are made. Where do body plans come from? Where do vertebrae and invertebrate organisms, how do they emerge? The Cambrian explosion refers to a, a layer in the, in the excavations uh, and to a time period of around 500 million years uh, a, uh, BC. And interestingly, within the excavated layers all over the world, for example, in British Columbia or actually in uh, Chengjian, China now, they have uncovered Cambrian fossils, all dated to this period. And what's more interesting is the range, I, I picked a range of 10 to 50 million years in which these fossils reside in the sediments of these excavated areas. Now the latest research is this all happened within about a 10 million year layer. So even more explosive than what was thought 10, 15, 25 years ago. It's more intense. So what you have here is, so the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. You have the beginning of prokaryotic is a fancy term meaning bacteria. <laughs> and this means organisms that have a nucleus with a membrane around it. Bacteria does not. Uh, but bacteria arrived on the scene about 3.8 billion years uh, ago. And organisms of a very primitive variety, about 2 billion years. And no one disputes this. This isn't in dispute. Then little to nothing. And then an explosion of all the basic organisms of life all of a sudden in the Cambrian layer of the fossil record. Is that a Darwinian mechanism of gradual, unguided uh, progress? It is not. And in fact, Darwin, who was aware of Cambrian fossils in his day, knew this was the decisive argument empirically, because he didn't know anything about DNA at the time, against his theory. And to quote, in case you can't read that, to the question why we do not find records of these vast primordial periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. The case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. Chapter 9 of Origin of Species. So you see that the fossil record, if you look at it in a macro level, of course there might be individual traces, and I mentioned two of them that the neo-Darwinists jump on, the horse evolution and the land mammal to whale evolution. Those are very popular in the textbooks. It's like the neo-Darwinists have their two, and, they're, and they, as if that would explain anything. And it, and it, by the way, doesn't explain what they think it does. But so the fossil record, in particular the Cambrian, uh, seems to uh, overwhelmingly show uh, a non-Darwinian record. The next slide is just pictures of what these fossils actually look like. Uh, and uh, as I say, they're anywhere from 540 to 500 million years old. Now the third argument, or third issue that's controversial today, and this one is probably the most decisive against neo-Darwinianism related to macro evolution, is DNA. Now I had a whole set of slides on DNA, the history of its discovery and so on, but we won't go over that. Um, if you really wanted to go back, you'd go back to a Catholic uh, priest. Uh, Gregor Mendel, who actually invented the science of heredity by his work with his uh, pea plants and uh, actually invented the whole notion of heredity in 1865. That was then, he gave a little uh, speech to, I think, 40 farmers in a field publishing his results somewhere in Czechoslovakia. And then for 30 years, that research was never referred to until about 1900, some British scientists read Mendel and realized they had something and explained other things they were seeing. But if you just do a quick fact sheet on DNA, As, as we know from high school, we have 46 chromosomes, 23 from each parent. In one human cell, 
You have over two yards of DNA. Did you know that? Three billion DNA subunits, these ATCGs. Maybe you've heard of these before, but they are the base, what they're called nucleotides, that are on the backbone of every DNA molecule. And we'll spend a little time on what that really means. There are about 30,000 genes that code for proteins, and I'll explain what that expression means at a high level, that perform most, if not all, of life's functions. Respiration, digestion, thinking. Now, I took this actually from a, safe, a seventh grade presentation. So <laughs> you, you've heard that uh, of that TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? <laughs> but Mrs. Tabor uh, actually gave a presentation to her seventh grade class on DNA, so I know this group can handle this. <laughs> Deoxyribose nucleic acid, that's DNA. It's a molecule that stores information. Note that term, information. Isn't that interesting? Why would that term be used? We'll, we'll see that in a moment. But it can, what does DNA do? It contains instructions for making proteins, just like a recipe to make a cake. One more slide on this. What's interesting is that what has been discovered, and again, this is not disputed, uh, that the sequence of those bases the A, T, G, C, T, A, G sequence, actually specify functions in amino acids, which then combine to make proteins. So when you hear the term genetic code or the genome or things like that, what it really means is these triplet codes, letters, they're not really letters. If you looked under a microscope, you wouldn't see these letters. But these are the... the the names given for these bases that code for an amino acid. So, for example, there are about 23,000 amino acids that combine to make muscle tissue, as an example. Uh, to pick another bizarre example, there are about 20 to 21 amino acids that combine to make uh, saliva in lizards differently. So, uh, but again, it's this, it specifies a function by which proteins then operate in cells. Francis Crick was one of the discoverers of the double helix nature of DNA in 1953. And I'd like to read a quote of his because it will advance this idea of information and why DNA is an information-bearing uh, element. By information, quote, I mean the specification of the amino acid sequence in the protein. Information means here the precise determination of sequence, either of bases in the nucleic acid or on amino acid residue in the protein. The point I want to emphasize with this is think of block letters on an old printing press. The sequence of the letters determines the meaning of the sentence. If I say God is wonderful on the printing press and then I rearrange the letters D and G, dog is wonderful. I get a different meaning. I could get gibberish if I kept moving letters around, adding things. And the same is true in DNA. If you alter the bases that form those amino acids and specify instructions, assembly instructions of amino acids by which proteins are formed, you get cystic fibrosis. You get sickle cell anemia. You get all the genetic engineering that's going on today. If you've read articles in the Wall Street Journal of late uh, referring to a CRISPR technology by which bioengineers can snip aspects of, the, of DNA and add it to the end of a longer sequence and get a new function. So this is settled science. No one disputes that we're talking about information-bearing properties of DNA. You see how this is now, you know, that, that sound you're hearing is the funeral parade of neo-Darwinism. <laughs> so Richard Dawkins, no friend of sane thinking or creationists by any stretch, and you notice I haven't even talked about religion because religion's irrelevant to this conversation at the moment. 
Richard Dawkins, who is a renowned neo-Darwinist and atheist and, and feels that Christianity is a form of child abuse, also recognizes this. Quote, the machine code of the genes, note the expression, the machine code, is uncannily uh, computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of a uh, molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. So this isn't debated uh, among either side. So in summary, DNA encodes instructions that builds proteins for life and cellular operations, which is why I say it resembles language, like that printing press or stencils or computer language. If you wanted to get a new game on your PC or laptop or phone, my nephew's here, so I gotta, he, he doesn't have a PC. Uh, what do you do? You download a new piece of software, right? You don't just sit there waiting for <laughs> the chess program to appear. You download new information onto your hard drive, and now you can play the game. So DNA works that way as it relates to life and specifically amino acids and proteins. So ask yourself a question. If that sequence is critical to function, the sequence of those letters, A, T, G, C, in those nucleotide bases that form those amino acids that build up proteins, if that's critical, that specified sequence, can a random process, can natural selection working on random mutations generate biological information. So recasting and restating the problem, the problem of the origin of the life is the problem of what is the origin of biological information. What is our experience of information in general? Specified information. When we drove here this, this evening and we saw the construction zone in front of the door, did we say to ourselves, isn't that amazing what wind and rain can do? <laughs> and how that caution yellow tape just happened to wrap like that? The wind must have really did something crazy. Or if, if we've ever been to Mount Rushmore, uh -huh. do we say, wow, isn't that amazing what wind and erosion can do? <laughs> so the question of the origin of life is really the question of what is the origin of biological information. Now, back to Richard Dawkins, who wrote a book in 1986 called The Blind Watchmaker. Now, that title is itself provocative because he was remembering William Paley, a household name I know, but Paley's Watch is a famous story of William Paley walking on the beach in a rugged area, rugged terrain, far away from any civilization, and he finds a watch on the ground. And, and he says to himself, why do I know that was made by a human being and the veins on the beach and the seaweed that's all over the place was not? Why is that random and this watch is specified? And this was the argument of design that was common in those days, I want to say the 18th century, and Richard Dawkins is recalling that by the title of his book, The Blind Watchmaker. Who is the blind watchmaker? It's natural selection working on random mutations. And Dawkins in another work will say, biology is a study of organisms that appear to be designed for a purpose but are not. What I like about Richard Dawkins is he's all in. He does not debate the facts, but he maintains his atheism. So he did a simulation in this book, The Blind Watchmaker, published in 1986, where he wanted to say, I could write a simple computer program that could take gibberish, generation one, 28 spaces, 27 possible letter space combinations, you know, so 26 letters of the alphabet, and then blank. And in a space of 43 generations, produce a specified informational sentence. And so in the book, 
he talked about how the initial program took three hours to run, then he, he tweaked it a bit, and it only took an hour to run. He said, I went to lunch. By the time I came back, it had iterated through all the generations, and we got to, me thinks it is a weasel, which is a line, I believe, from Hamlet. So that was his experiment, and, and he put this in his book to show this is how natural selection working on random mutations without any appeal to God or any other weird thing uh, can explain how we go from gibberish, the prebiotic soup of inorganic matter, to life, to specified informational complexity. What's the problem with this? It's not an example of a Darwinian mechanism. Why? Because if you notice, he's retaining in each generation the letter that matches the, the target message. And you can even see it in the last iteration. Me thinks it is like I weasel. You, you could tell the program is going through the vowels A, E, I, O, U. So I, O, U, A. So 41, 42, 40. that's how the vowels worked. Every, every digit, A, E, I, O, U, and then all the letters that match, and then he retains it. Now, that's cheating, right? In the real world, if you've got bad DNA, you don't survive. There is no retaining the target message as you go. The finch can't eat the seeds, it dies. It doesn't pass on anything. So that's not an example, and as I mentioned there, by retaining the elements of the target phrase all throughout the algorithm, he's violating the, the, the whole principles of Darwinism, of unguided, blind, and random. And in fact, just to, to put the final headlock, um, A.G. Karn Smith was another Darwinist who thought he could show how you go from inorganic matter to life. He was a, uh, an organic chemist and a, a molecular biologist from the University of Glasgow. Uh, he just died last year, as a matter of fact. He wrote several works on this. He even wrote a work on how consciousness evolved using quantum mechanics. But even he wrote, quote, blind chance is very limited. Low levels of cooperation, he, blind chance, can produce exceedingly easily the equivalent of small letters and uh, letters and small words, but he, blind chance, becomes very quickly incompetent as the amount of organization increases. What he means by that is suppose we want to write lots of sentences, not just me thinks it is a weasel, but the entire play of Hamlet. It gets harder and harder for an unguided mechanism to to do that. It doesn't get easier the more time you give it. it. It generates more gibberish. Why is generating more gibberish a barrier? Because you start killing off everything. There's a whole study called uh, population genetics of how disease spreads. And, and the worst kinds of disease don't kill all the hosts. Because <laughs> if they did, there'd be nothing left. It's very hard for a beneficial trait to spread in a large population. I won't go into that, but he spends a lot of time on showing the earth, the, the earth could be 50 billion years old. That doesn't solve the problem. It makes it worse, actually. It makes it harder. And, and just for the computer uh, software developers in the room, and, and they know this intuitively, uh, and my brother is a software developer, and. He, he would tell you this and other things. Uh, but uh, randomness actually is the enemy of code and software programs and functions. So to suggest that randomness, given enough time, can create beneficial functional DNA sequences and organisms it is simply ludicrous to anyone who's actually uh, in this field of software development and DNA research if they're honest about it. Because I'm talking, again, not about traits within a species, like dog breeders. I'm talking about the origin of life, and how do you go from a cow to a blue whale? That's what I'm talking about. So summing up, 
I, I like this expression, so I, I, I included it. Darwin showed the survival of the fittest within a species. Well done. But he didn't show the arrival of the fittest of a new species. And if you read his work, The Origin of Species, he doesn't demonstrate any of that. He's a very good observer of nature and a very good writer and a very talented zoologist. But in his work, he never explains the origin of species. He explains variation within species. So as I put here, he proceeded from the legitimate insight of natural selection explaining variation within a species, but he made an unjustified move, what I call an extrapolation to macroevolution, using the same mechanism to explain origin of life and speciation. That was the error Darwin made. He certainly had a basis for talking about microevolution, how traits come and go within a species, within a family of animals. But to use that and make the move to, and this explains macroevolution, the origin of life and the origin of species, that was the error. And as time progressed, that error has become larger and larger for the reasons I mentioned, the fossil record and the discovery and elaboration of DNA. If you think about it, natural selection as an expression, neo-Darwinism, it's a tautology. So whatever survives is fit. Whatever's fit survives. It, you, you haven't explained anything. Things that survive, survive because they have certain advantages. Okay, and they pass those advantages on to their offspring. I think we'd all agree with that. But that's not an explanation of how that happens, or it's certainly not an explanation of the origin of the species in the first place. So it's a tautology. It's a logical fallacy to think that this explains anything. As I say in the end here, the pop culture and our introductory biology textbooks, the way they read, there's kind of this frant frantic expression around natural selection that is, you know, so you'll read wonderful chapters on, on cell function, you'll read wonderful chapters on uh, different ways that cells process, and then you get to the Darwinian chapters and all of a sudden the language changes. It, it becomes a bit over the top. And, and you're like, well, what, what was, what's going on here? <laughs> so as I put it, Darwin, Neo-Darwinism today is really just a metaphysical research project for atheists. It's, it's, it's a kind of religion, in my opinion. Here's the whammy on it, ultimately, if, if what I'm saying isn't convincing, because there are counter-arguments to what I'm saying. But ask yourself this. For Darwin, what is selected is the organism. The organism survives, or it doesn't. It adapted successfully, or it didn't. But what's mutating? It's mutating at the genetic level. So how do you ensure that a favorable genetic mutation survives if the organism as a whole does not survive? You see, because Darwin had no theory of heredity and no understanding of the cell and no understanding of DNA, there's another logical problem with the theory in its macro sense. There's a disconnect between what's selected, the organism as a whole, right or wrong, with all of its good genes and bad genes, and what were the favorable genes that mutated that gave it the advantage? Are those decisive? What if the white-furred fox gets eaten, doesn't pass on its DNA, and yet that was a favorable trait in winter? <clears throat> So you see, it's, there's a logical problem with the theory as well. So we probably need a little humor. Uh, Mom, why does brother's beak look different than mine? It's a secret you can't tell anyone, but your brother's adapted. <laughs> I figured you'd need a little laugh after all that biology. We'll take questions at the end because I don't want to make light of what I just covered because uh, I'm, in truth, not being fair to the other side because there are counter arguments to what I've been saying. 
for example, the fossil record, if there are cataclysmic events that occurred 60 million years ago or 200 million years ago, as people think there are, what would that do to the fossil record? It might disturb it. If sedimentation occurs more slowly than the presence of the species in the fossil record, it would appear to be sudden. It's all in that layer. So there are counter arguments to what I'm saying as well. But there, I've never heard a good counter argument to the DNA discoveries. So you can see why anything empirical is always going to be subject to revision. The fossil record is empirical. It could change. We might discover some things that would show that gradualism of Darwin. So it's possible that could be revised. So I mention this also because as Catholics, the good news is it doesn't matter to us under one condition, which theory you believe, and we'll get to that in a moment. But as Catholics, you could take the other side of those three arguments that I just made against Darwinism, except for one thing, and we'll talk about that now. 1950, Humani Generis Pope Pius XII. This was an encyclical on a variety of subjects. Uh, one was on uh, Thomistic philosophy and theology. Others were treating certain errors that had crept into the teaching institutions of the church. That never happens. Um, and so he also spent some time on evolution. Quote, for these reasons, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields takes place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. In, so, in as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from preexistent and living matter, for the Catholic faith obliges us to hold, did I jump a line? Yeah, I'm sorry. Take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. In as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from preexistent and living matter, for the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. That's the catch. However, this must be done in such a way that the reasons for both opinions, that is, those favorable and those unfavorable to evolution, be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness, moderation, and measure that all are prepared to submit to the judgment of the church to whom Christ has given the mission of interpreting authentically the sacred scriptures and of defending the dogmas of faith. Some, however, rashly transgress this liberty of discussion when they act as if the origin of the human body coming from pre-existing and living matter were already completely certain and proved by the facts which have been discovered up to now and by reasoning on those facts and as if there were nothing in the sources of divine revelation which demands the greatest moderation and caution in this question. Now we come to it. That's the wind-up. So here's the, the pitch. When, however, there's a question of another conjectural opinion, namely polygenism, I should explain that polygenism means that our origins come from multiple parents or small communities or villages, not a single set of parents. So that's polygenism. Namely, polygenism. The children of the church by no means enjoy such liberty. Why not? For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him, as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Now, it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regard to original sin, which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual Adam in which through generation is passed on to all and is in everyone as his own. So you see the problem. If we affirm that there was polygenism, namely multiple first parents, that's a bizarre expression, but multiple parents. How then do you have the transmission of original sin to all? 
So imagine you're in a village, you're in village A, and then someone runs into your village from village B and says, Adam just sinned. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with me? What, why is that on my back now? <coughs> what happened over there? I told him not to. So you see how that's an odd state of affairs. But what's interesting is the language here, which papal interpreters immediately pounce on. And it's the expression, now it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a slight opening there. What Pius XII is saying, it's, uh, the burden is on those who think there are multiple first parents, I'll just keep using that expression, to show how the doctrine of original sin is not compromised, of our first parents sinning, and then we inherit that. So let's have the plot thicken a little bit. We fast forward to 1996, when John Paul II is addressing the Pontifical Academy on Science in regard to evolution. Quote, today, more than a half century after the appearance of that encyclical, namely the one we just read from, from Pius XII, some new findings lead us toward the recognition of evolution as more than a hypothesis. In fact, it is remarkable that this theory has had progressively greater influence on the spirit of researchers, following a series of discoveries in different scholarly disciplines. The convergence in the results of these independent studies, which was neither planned nor sought, constitutes in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. Of course, the question in reading this is, what are you referring to, John Paul? What is the significance of a theory such as this one? To open this question is to enter into the field of epistemology. A theory is a meta-scientific elaboration, which is distinct from, but in harmony with the results of observation. With the help of such a theory, a group of data and independent facts can be related to one another and interpreted in one comprehensive explanation. The theory proves its validity by the measure to which it can be verified. It is constantly being tested against the facts. When it can no longer explain these facts, it shows its limits and its lack of usefulness, and it must be revised. I think this second section is clearly has in mind some of the things we've referred to, particularly with the discovery of DNA. Moreover, the elaboration of a theory as that of evolution, while obedient to the need for consistency with the observed data, must also involve importing some ideas from the philosophy of nature. And to tell the truth, rather than speaking about the theory of evolution, it is more accurate to speak of the theories of evolution. The use of the plural here is required, in part because of the diversity of explanations regarding the mechanism of evolution and in part because of the diversity of philosophies involved. There are materialist and reductionist theories as well as spiritualist theories. I'll just pause there. An Orthodox Catholic position is simply God can use the mechanism of evolution to produce life. There's no, nothing incompatible about that. There's nothing incompatible about that with Genesis. But continuing... Here, the final judgment is within the competence of philosophy and beyond that of theology. The magisterium of the church takes a direct interest in the question of evolution because it touches on the conception of man, whom Revelation tells us was created in the image and likeness of God. The conciliar constitution, Gaudium et Spes, from Vatican II, has given us a magnificent exposition of this doctrine, which is one of its essential elements of Christian thought. The council recalled that man is the only creature on earth that God wanted for its own sake. The rest of creation were the steward of that creation. Man is. In other words, the human person cannot be subordinated as a means to an end or as an instrument of either the species or the society. He has a value of his own. He is a person. By this intelligence and his will, he is capable of entering into a relationship of communion, of solidarity, of the gift of himself to others like himself. So God and evolution and the human person are compatible, but he's now going to winnow in a bit more on what is essential. It is by virtue of his eternal soul that the whole person, including his body, possesses such great dignity. Pius XII underlined the essential point. 
If the origin of the human body comes through living matter, which existed previously, the spiritual soul is created directly by God. That's a quote from Pius XII. As a result, the theories of evolution, which, because of the philosophies which inspire them, regard the spirit either as emerging from the forces of living matter or as a simple epiphenomenon of that matter, are, in, are incompatible with the truth about man. They are therefore unable to serve as the basis for the dignity of the human person. So to pause there, there's nothing in evolutionary theory taken in a Catholic sense that is contrary to God creating everything. When you get the atheistic philosophy as the extra freight with that theory, that's where the Pope, both Pope Pius XII and John Paul II, are saying that's, it, that's wrong because it doesn't do justice to the dignity of the human person. And it's not necessary. It's not needed. It's not certainly a datum of experience. There's nothing in science could, frankly, ever disprove the existence of God because that's not its method. Wrapping uh, this passage up, number six, with man we find ourselves facing a different ontological order, an ontological leap, we could say. But imposing such a great ontological discontinuity, are we not breaking up the physical continuity, which seems to be the main line of research about evolution in the fields of physics and chemistry? An appreciation for the different methods used in different fields of scholarship allows us to bring together two points of view, which at first seem irreconcilable. The sciences of observation describe and measure with ever greater precision the many manifestations of life and write them down along the timeline. The moment of passage into the spiritual realm is not something that can be observed in this way. Although we can nevertheless discern through experimental research a series of very valuable signs of what is specifically human life, but the experience of metaphysical knowledge of self-consciousness and self-awareness of moral conscience, of liberty, or of aesthetic and religious experience. All of these must be analyzed through philosophical reflection while theology seeks to clarify the ultimate meaning of the creator's designs. So there is room in the Pope's vision for theories of evolution, provided they don't come with the atheistic materialism that isn't necessary for them in the first place. The last piece on this was written by uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger, who is Pope Benedict XVI, to the International Theological Commission in 2004. And I quote this uh, because it's a continuation of this stream of thought. Catholic theology affirms that the emergence of the first members of the human species, whether as individuals or in populations, I, I kind of stopped right there. Isn't that interesting? There is now a implicit reference to polygenism, which Pius XII didn't entertain but allowed a little wiggle room on. So Catholic theology affirms that the emergence of the first members of the human species, whether as individuals or in populations, represents an event that is not susceptible of a purely natural explanation and which can appropriately be attributed to divine intervention. Acting indirectly through causal chains operating from the beginning of cosmic history, God prepared the way for what Pope John Paul II has called an ontological leap, the moment of transition to the spiritual. So that's an interesting development. Now this is a statement by the head of the Doctrine of the Congregation of the Faith to a particular audience, the International Theological Commission. So its status as magisterial teaching is limited. It would be in the area of theological opinion. It's only as good as the argument, in other words. It doesn't enjoy any prerogative beyond that, unlike definitive statements of the magisterium like on abortion, or that God is a trinity, or that Jesus is divine and human, which do enjoy that prerogative. 
So let's summarize this uh, and then move to our last section. This ontological leap from mere matter, I always enjoy G.K. Chesterton's expression, man is a revolution, not an evolution. That's that ontological leap. And it is healthy Catholic orthodoxy to affirm that the preparation of the human body could be achieved through indirect, incremental, or catastrophic steps as a preparation for God's direct intervention and in infusing a human soul. Now, when I've mentioned this in the past, people will, will jump out at me, but ask yourself, you know, in Genesis, we're created from dust. Does that sound better than a, than a hominid from, you know, 80,000 years ago? Ask yourself, you know, what's preferable? <laughs> there's another sense in which there's a hidden bias we have. We think the more nature does, the less God does, and it's somehow less dignifying the more nature does. If if we're subject to the whimsical cycles of evolution and then God jumps in at the end of that process, we somehow feel that's less uh, dignified than if God directly created Adam and Eve right from the jump, just like that. But that's really not true when you examine that more closely. So keep that in mind, that God as the primary cause of everything that is works through secondary causes anyway. And the more secondary causes doesn't mean there's less God. God doesn't cooperate with secondary causes in a competitive way that we do. So if I want to make a sandwich, I have to plug my toaster in. I have to get the bread out of the fridge. And, you know, do I have enough grape jelly? Uh, did I get the peanut butter with nuts or not? You know, it's exhausting for someone like me to think about this. God doesn't cooperate with secondary causality that way. It's non-competitive transcendence, to use an expression that Bishop Barron coined several years ago. But my little point at the end there, the key thing we have to protect in our Catholic faith is this, that our first parents were created in original innocence and goodness with God, and through an act of disobedience, launched the heritage of original sin. And that we, by having a human nature, which we get from our first parents, bear the weight of that in all the effects that we hear in the catechism. That's what has to be protected. Can that come through polygenism? That question has opened a bit in papal statements, as we've seen. The default position was monogenism for a very long time. But this is the constructive role that research into the life sciences and archaeology and other sciences can help the faith purify itself of things that are not essential. Which tees up my last section. I'll, I'll keep rolling just a few slides, then we can open up for questions. Pius XII himself in a very famous uh, encyclical called Divino Aflante Spiritu, actually established new parameters or, or parameters that have been lost for biblical research for Catholic scholars. So let me share with you a few quotes here. Quote, what is the literal sense of a passage is not always as obvious in the speeches and writings of the ancient authors of the East as it is in the works of our own time. For what they wish to express is not to be determined by the rules of grammar and philology alone, nor solely by the context. This is why at Mass we often are sleeping through the readings of the Old Testament. <laughs> what are they talking about? All these names and the names of these towns and cities and this intricate history of Israel and the odd way of expressing things in Genesis. The repetition, we've got the two stories of the flood. We've got two stories of Abraham giving his wife, Sarah, to the, you know, what's going on with all of this weird repetition? It doesn't agree with itself all the time. You know, we've got two accounts of the creation. Uh, one, uh, plants are made on the third day, and the fourth day the sun is made. How does that work? Uh, 
man's made at the end in chapters 1 and 2, and then in chapters 2 and 3, man's made at the beginning. What's going on? So that's just to give you a little rest from me reading to you. Uh, <clears throat> the interpreter must, as it were, go back wholly in spirit to those remote centuries of the East and with the aid of history, archaeology, ethnology, and other sciences accurately determine what modes of writing, so to speak, the authors of that ancient period would be likely to use, and in fact did use. For the ancient peoples of the East, in order to express their ideas, did not always employ those forms or kinds of speech which we use today, but rather those used by the men of their times and countries. What those exactly were, the commentator cannot determine as it were in advance, but only after careful examination of the ancient literature of the East. So I've mentioned this to you before in past years, but the Bible is not one book. The Bible is a library. And just as when you walk into the Lake Forest Library and you bank left uh, and you see the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, you know you're in the fiction section. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no. But you're, you're reading a newspaper and maybe the weather and the sports page are factual. Uh, but you read those differently than if you banked right and started reading poems and literature. You, you see how you have a different lens when you read. Why? Because it's different, it's different types of genre that are being used. So I read differently if I'm reading news articles and if I'm reading a novel than if I'm reading history, then I'm reading a physics textbook. I have a different lens by which I read. And yet people come to the Bible and, and, and say, well, it's literal. And no one, none of the church fathers ever thought it was literal. And yet everything has to be read the same way in the Bible. Where, where's that coming from? That's highly uncritical, and it's kind of uh, childish. So keep that in mind. So, quote, finishing this off, this clearly points out that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which really take you through Abraham, although properly speaking not conforming to the historical method used by the best Greek and Latin writers or by competent authors of our time, do never, nevertheless pertain to history in a true sense, which, however, must be further studied and determined by exegetes. The same chapters in simple and metaphorical language adapted to the mentality of a people but little cultured both state the principal truths which are fundamental for our salvation and also give a popular description of the origin of the human race and the chosen people. If, however, the ancient sacred writers have taken anything from popular narrations of that time, and this may be conceded, it must never be forgotten that they did so with the help of divine inspiration, through which they were rendered immune from any error in selecting and evaluating those documents as it pertains to our salvation. So note, it's a two-step move. One is these ancient texts, however they came to pass, use modes of expression in literary genres very much different from our own, can still express truths about our origins and the history of salvation. And from that, they're protected from error. This is the basis for the proper understanding of biblical inspiration. It gets you out of the dilemma of, I have to read these texts literally, to, I have to read these texts according to the genre that I'm reading. Okay, so let me give just some quick examples. And then we can wrap up. Every Old Testament biblical scholar will have spent time reading other cultures' texts of the time. And the two most interesting uh, texts, some are on tablets actually, are the Enuma Elish, a Babylonian uh, story, uh, which basically is very similar to Hesiod's Theogony, if you are familiar with Greek writers of, say, 800 years before Christ. Basically, the origin of the dominance of God, or gods, so emerging out of this war of the gods, Marduk emerges as the most powerful god. 
And so the Enuma Elish, which I believe is written on uh, seven tablets and is missing some lines, uh, describes this divine uh, conflict among six gods, and he emerges as the dominant god. There are many references in it that are provocative and, and can be reflected back in Genesis. The even more interesting one, because we have a more complete text of it, is the Gilgamesh epic. This one is even older, and it, it might even describe events, people think, going back to 2700 B.C., but uh, certainly it's dated in terms of its original composition, which we don't necessarily have, around 1800 B.C., and it describes the adventures of Gilgamesh. And among other things, Gilgamesh is in search of immortality. The vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the lefts and rights, the devastations, the joys, he's in search of immortality, and eventually he finds a leaf that is, bears within it the secrets of immortality, and he's overjoyed. His, his long journey has finally come to an end. And as he's returning home with the leaf, he decides to put it on the ground momentarily and go for a swim. Why you would do that, we don't know, but it, it, it develops a story. A serpent happens to come along and eat the leaf. So Gilgamesh loses his immortality, which is why serpents can shed their skin and were thought to be immortal. So the point is not, wow, that's an interesting story, and that's what the Genesis writer just blindly copied. That's, that's not the point I want you to draw. What it means, though, is how interesting Genesis is written, in some people's opinion, which I happen to prefer, as a polemical argument against the polytheism of their time. But the writer of Genesis most likely someone in the history of Israel, under divine inspiration, in attempt to distinguish why is our faith uh, better than our neighbors, is recalling human origins and purifying the Babylonian texts of his time that are rampant about all this polytheism and all this other nonsense to purify the or human origins and, more importantly, the nature of God. It might be as simple as that, that Genesis is this privileged account by which its writer wanted to distinguish the faith of Israel, ethical monotheism, from the violent polytheism of the time. So what's distinctive about Genesis versus these Babylonian myths where you have multiple gods, some are good, some are evil, fighting, out of that emerges Marduk, the dominant god, or Hesiod in Greek mythology, writing about the conflicts of Kronos, Zeus, the Titans, if, if you read uh, the Theogony, and out of that emerges Zeus as primal and primary, rather than good and evil coexisting together from the beginning, we affirm that God, the one true living God, was at the beginning, and he was good. There is no dualism of evil gods at the beginning. Secondly, creation is the result of God willing it into existence, not the sexual congress of good and evil gods. Not violence, as some gods were created in Greek mythology. But rather, it's created by the Spirit of God. It's rational. That's why we don't worship nature, because it's not God. This sounds obvious to us. It's actually come back in our culture now, the worship of the earth. Does anyone know what I'm referring to, by the way? Tree hugging is one expression, but global, the global warming movement in its extreme forms. As Pascal said, those who would lick the earth. 
And lastly, Genesis, as I mentioned, separates the origin of good and evil. God is good. Creation is good. And it becomes perverted. Evil is a byproduct. It's a parasite that feasted on good and corrupted it. It's a fundamentally different vision of the universe and of God than of the Babylonian myths, than of Hinduism, Buddhism. It's a fundamentally different view of reality. There can be similarities in spiritual exercises, but the heavy lifting, the cosmology, is different. And as we know, morality flows from cosmology. That's a whole other class. But Interestingly, though, the devil, who makes an appearance as the serpent, somehow does pre-exist in the Genesis story, the creation of Adam and Eve. There we have room for the bad angels in creation, the devils. So, interestingly, evil comes from our act of disobedience of our first parents and pride within, and from the lure of some external factor, the serpent, the devil. But the Genesis story makes clear two things. This evil... Original sin and the effects of original sin. We will die. We have to work by the sweat of our brow. Women will bear children in pain and other things is inherent now in human nature. Human nature is not reducible to that because it was created good. But it's wounded. It's weakened. You remember the term concupiscence. Our minds are darkened and our wills are weak. So let me summarize, and then we can, in the time left, open up for questions, because I've, I've thrown a lot at you, but it was a lot of ground to cover. But the natural sciences can help the faith. How? By what I call purifying it of its time-based attachments, or its heirloom attachments that perhaps aren't valid. One example from the past that would be popular is limbo. Remember, limbo was the place where unbaptized babies went, which is not something we promote these days, and it was just a theological opinion anyway. It seems a bit ghoulish in some ways. Uh, but limbo was promoted. Uh, so Theology and philosophy, in, in this case, helps the faith purified of these attachments that may not be essential. So to the natural sciences, and in this uh, discussion tonight we've been talking about evolution, can help purify the faith as we deepen our study of monogenism and polygenism and the book of Genesis, the influence of ancient Near East texts on that writer. What were they? There seems to be a lot of similarities. The faith can help science. How? You can believe in the theory of evolution without being an atheist. It's not required. You can be liberated from that kind of silly attachment. Because as Catholics, as Christians, we can believe God works through any mechanism he wants to choose to create life and to create human life. And, and there can never be any conflict between religion and science. The false choices our culture presents us. Why? Because God is the author of sacred scripture and of nature. So we know that there can never be any conflict. And in fact, one resources the other and helps purify the other of these unhelpful attachments. Thirdly, possibly... Subject to further review, the writer of Genesis purified the Babylonian stories, the polytheistic stories of his time, to recall true human origins and the true nature of God, particularly as it was revealed to the people of Israel and in salvation history of the Old Testament. It's an interesting perspective. It might be correct. It might not be. But this biblical perspective I'm talking about can help us today, how we face a polytheistic culture today, right now. Ethical monotheism, 
means we are accountable to a personal God. We are not a cosmic accident. We are not a side thought. We are, in fact, personally willed into existence by a God who did not need to create. That's how we know it's personal, by the way. If God didn't have to create, the fact that he did means he's personally involved which completely clashes with the polytheism of 2,000 and 3,000 years ago, and it clashes with the culture today. What are the, the polytheisms of today? We mentioned one of them, of earth worship. In another class, we talked about the sovereign self and its appetites. If you ever watch golf on television, the fertility drugs or the performance drugs related to fertility or infertility. You can't watch a round of golf anymore on TV. <laughs> What's going on? This, this almost... Hey, hey. <laughs> but kidding aside, this, this kind of mad obsession we have Cialis and Viagra and what, what's going on? And you'll read articles about the sewers of New York are clogged with latex condoms. I mean, people don't, but you know, what is going on? We are all witnessing the polytheism of our time. You thought it was just Babylonian tablets and, and, and Marduk and Asu and all the other gods. It, it continues, and in fact, that is, the human person left to themselves is completely available to all those atrocities. I can remember Cardinal George once saying that without grace, there was no sin he didn't feel he was incapable of committing. Without grace, we're available for all of it, all of the atrocities. And so that is the default position, actually, of society left to itself. Godless societies don't remain neutral. The fence doesn't remain bright white when it's painted. It turns gray. There's no such thing as secular space that's broad-minded and, and truly relativistic. It always corrupts into creating countrywide concentration camps. So that's the default position. And the genius of Genesis is saying, no, it's not that way. What has been revealed is that there's one true living God. There is monotheism. And that that God has called us to a life. And it's a personal God. We're not a cosmic afterthought of some undirected process. That is radically different 3,000 years ago, and it's radically different today in the Western culture. So... That's why this reading of Genesis is so interesting and provocative for me and helps my faith because it's exactly what I think all of us would have written when Genesis was written, when you're surrounded by corruption under divine inspiration. So that's what I had for tonight, a lot of material, and we, we bounced above the surface of it. Are there any uh, questions? Yes. So the question is, given the research in origins of, of human species out of Africa, has that now been demonstrated by the DNA research that they've done? There's a lot of literature on this, and I would say the dominant opinion, and I, in no way would I represent myself as an expert on this at all, but the dominant literature would indicate what you suggest, that all human species came out of an area in Africa and that we share 99.999% of that DNA. The question is, is that not consistent with Genesis, Adam, and Eve? Yes, on one level, but we cannot fall for the trap of uh, what's interesting about scientific inquiry is its open-ended nature. It's always subject to further verification, new discoveries. So we can't fall for the trap of, ah, now Genesis is based on this theory in science. You see, we, we've, just, we've just fallen for the trap again. It's nice when science gives us validation like this, absolutely. Uh, 
and it's great if it's useful, but it always has, it's always subject to further review and modification as well. This comes up in what's called seismic events in evolutionary theory, because they know the fossil record doesn't explain life, so they refer to meteor strikes hitting planet Earth that had carbon residue on them, and then that started the engine of life, or other seismic events that occur, and there's like five or six events over the last uh, three billion years that scientists ref refer to. So you, you always have to be careful. What if a seismic event localized some portion of origin of human species, but then another set is discovered? You don't want to simply equate the genesis story with this particular physical theory, because it will always be revised. So the question is, if the finches or any organism has a favorable trait but passes away, by definition that would not pass on to their children. And, and the question was around the finches on the Galap Galapagos Islands. And what's interesting is researchers went back to that island in the 1970s, and they timed it with El Nino effects that created drought conditions. As a result, the plants in the area only produced large seeds in the 1970s. And they discovered that there were only finches with large, brittle beaks. They went back 20 years later, after uh, the, the rain trend changed, there was more rain. All the, all the beaks were back to the normal size within 25 years. What they didn't find was those finches turned into rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> Question. Yeah, it's a mine. So how accepted is the refutation that I went through of the Darwinian theory in its macro sense? And it's a minority opinion. There's no question about it. If you went on a college campus and interviewed the faculty in the biology department, uh, fresh after signing their grants, uh, how much grant? Uh, that, that's a bad argument to make. That's a cheap <laughs> argument to make. Uh, but this is a minority view uh, that I was expressing. If you go to a high school campus or, as I say, and interview the faculty members, uh, the views I'm expressing are certainly the minority view. So Absolutely. Mind, oh, I believe it is. It, but I'm completely open to uh, the debate because, as I mentioned, as Catholics, we're indifferent except for that one condition that God directly infused a human soul at the right point in the process. Otherwise, we're indifferent. So that's why I like the arguments more than the resolution. But I just find the argument from DNA is so obvious to me that you have to be religious not to be swayed by it. You have to be a religious atheist, in other words. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Enjoy the treats. Thank you.